going to turn this over to our moderator this evening, Aline Smithson. Many of you know her already. She is a major influencer in the fine art photography world. She's changed the lives of many photographers, inspired them to pursue their photographic passions. Uh, Aline is a longtime faculty member here at the Los Angeles Center of Photography. She also serves on our board of directors. For those of you who are not aware, uh, Aline has a uh, blog called Lens Scratch, which is a daily journal that explores contemporary fine art photography and offers opportunities for exposure and community. Uh, Aline has a special announcement tonight, uh, so I'm going to give the floor to you. Aline, Thank you listen. so much, Brandon. I love looking out at this audience. I have so many friends, and I see you, and I am so appreciative that you're here tonight. I just send you big hugs. And even if you're not a friend, I send you big hugs. Um, thank you for taking this time out of your busy lives. And um, I have to extend so much gratitude to the Los Angeles Center of Photography and the stellar staff that makes these evenings possible. But what I am really excited to announce is that LACP has a brand new executive director, Rotem Rosenthal, and she is just getting her feet wet, but we look forward to our future with great enthusiasm as we welcome her into our family. She's incredibly dynamic. She has a PhD in photography. She is going to really uh, bring the center to a whole new level. And for all of us, that's incredibly exciting. So as Brandon said, tonight is the third in a series of four monthly evenings of Artist Talks. Next month, please join us on April 21st for the final presentation. When I started teaching the master class through LACP in January, 2021, we were a year into the pandemic. The participants were 11 women from all over the country. And as the months passed, I never could have imagined that the group would be so profoundly bonded and our efforts would result in the exhibition, Memory is a Verb, Exploring Time and Transience. We discovered that we were all exploring the liminal space between time and transience in completely different ways. Represented in this exhibition are the universal concepts of loss, mortality, legacy, and the exploration of what inspires us to seek solace and re-examine our histories. Subsequently, unearthing discoveries about ourselves, our relationships and our place in the universe. I am so honored to shepherd these amazing artists who are now amazing friends and celebrate their work tonight. So we're, we're, we have three artist talks. Um, I am going to um, deal with the questions after each artist talk. So I'm not gonna wait to the very end. Uh, so if you have questions for our first speaker, put them in the chat while she is uh, sharing her work. Our first speaker is Lori Odover, who is on the board of LACP. Um, she's a lens-based artist who uses memory, nature, and the family album to investigate elements of identity and geography. Her work examines nuances of emotion, beauty and tension in order to tell stories that allow for a reclamation and, and consideration of self. She received a BA from Sarah Lawrence in philosophy. And after a career in New York, she had a career in real estate. Ordover graduated in 2014 from the International Center of Photography Continuing Education Program. Ordover was selected as a Critical Mass 2021 finalist, and her photographs have earned her recognition in International Fine Art Photography Awards. The International Photography Awards for Street Photography, the New York Center for Photographic Art, 
and the South by Southeast magazine. She has exhibited with the International Center of Photography, the New York Center of Photographic Art, Poisson Rouge Gallery, Umbrella Arts Gallery, Handwrite Gallery, and the South by Southeast Gallery, amongst others. And she has just released an artist book titled Silence Is. Ordover currently serves on the Board of Trustees for the Los Angeles Center of Photography and the Penumbra Found Organization. And if you don't know what the Penumbra Organization is, check it out. It's all about historic processes. It's an amazing or organization in New York. Um, so welcome, Lori. So Thank happy you. to have you here this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen, for being generous with your guidance and exceptional photographic knowledge. Thank you, Los Angeles Center of Photography for your thoughtful and creative programming. And to my fellow Memory as a Verb artists, you have encouraged and inspired me. Good evening. It's a privilege to share with you my journey to becoming an artist, memoirist, and photographer. I grew up in New Rochelle, New York with an older brother, a deaf mother, and a father who was an electrical engineer, an inventor, and a double agent working for the US government, passing false documents to Russia. This last part I learned later in life. At the age of 10, my love of photography was born when my father gifted me a Pentax camera purchased on one of his many business trips abroad. Over the years, he brought home film cameras from the different countries he visited. I explored my world with these cameras, photographing mostly friends and family. The camera became my constant companion. My mother was an extraordinary woman and overcame many challenges, having been born deaf. In 1964, she became a leader in the pension business. Here is Barbara, the only woman in her agency. The combination of my mother's deafness and my father's absence due to his travels created a loneliness in me which seemed to dissipate whenever I was taking photographs. I learned at school how to use a darkroom. I was so lucky my cousin lent me his darkroom equipment when he left for the service. I loved equally the creation of the image and developing the image. Fortunately, my high school had a photography program immersing me in the study of photography and courses in alternative development processes. The school was an all boys school and I was one of four women to be of the first class of women in the school's 100 plus year history. My mom, having been a trailblazer in her field, gave me the confidence to attend an all boys school. The school did its best to be inclusive but was not prepared with activities for women. Fortunately, the photography program not only enabled me unique access to events, it also enabled me to document the world of these young men navigating through high school. Soon after high school, I married at an early age and had two children. I began a job working with luxury real estate developers, designing their sales and marketing campaigns. At the same time, I began taking classes at the International Center of Photography. I was introduced to Bernd and Hilla Bescher and the Dusseldorf School of Photography. I began photographing venting systems in the style of the Bescher's, the singularity of the subject, the exacting compositions, and finding beauty in industrial design resonated with me. This became my first visual language, focused on the exactness of the composition. These images, titled Urban Iconography, were shown in a solo gallery show at La Poisson Rouge Gallery in New York City. The work was deeply influenced by my father's love of technical design and his products graphic design. In creating these images, New York City became the stage and the residents of the city, my subject. I continued my focus on the interaction of New York City and its residents and began my journey into street photography. 
Street photography was a challenge for me at first due to hearing my mother's words in my head. Don't look at strangers. Don't talk to strangers. I quickly learned that most strangers are friendly and generous and didn't mind being photographed. The interactions were thrilling to me and every chance possible, I photographed street scenes. I like to trick the eye. And as in these two images, I created illusions using construction fencing as my backdrop. I remarried and lived with my husband in New Canaan, Connecticut. The natural splendor of the area enveloped me. At a nature preserve near my home, I was stopped by the beauty of aging tree stumps. I photographed them through the seasons. The Besher teachings flowed into this work as I focused on the geometry of the growth rings of the tree trunks and the rings of the trunks mimicked the dials of my father's watches. I had a, so, a solo show titled Logos at the Handwrite Gallery in New Canaan, Connecticut. Re-engaging my interest in alternative processing from my high school days, I began creating with wet plate tintype photography and an old four by five camera. Inspired by my father's inventiveness, I've always been attracted to the technical side of photography. Tintypes have a low ISO or light sensitivity. An eight to 20 second exposure is not uncommon. Working with dancers in motion was a challenge to capture without much blur. I created this work at Penumbra Foundation in New York City. This work was published in Hand Magazine, issue number 32, April of 2021. I finished studying at International Center of Photography and not long after I moved to Los Angeles. My education continued through travel workshops with a focus on landscape photography. I often use an infrared camera and long exposures. My father's love of technology once again inspired me in this next body of work. Just before the pandemic, my husband underwent heart surgery. Once he got home, he received flowers as get well gifts. The quarantine started a week later. I began to use his flowers and my film scanner to create conceptual arrangements. They evoked my anxiety about his recovery and this period of global anxiety we were all living through. Having never before used a film scanner to create imagery, I developed my own technique to create a still life with interpretation from the scanner. I designed a way to suspend the flowers over the scanner without touching it, which brings more depth to the image. Over a period of eight months, I made around 50 images. Once the get well flowers had been used, I started going to the farmer's market to choose flowers and make my own arrangements. For every successful image, I would have at least 20 failed attempts. I enjoy creating like this. It brought, brought me back to my darkroom days when I would excitedly wait for the image to appear in the developer tray. The unexpected results feel like a collaboration between me technology, and the particularity of the flower. The technical term for these flower images is scanogram. Most recently, I've begun to write stories about my extraordinary family. Over the years, I've collected family images dating back from the late 1920s. Time and transience become an integral part of my stories. It's an evolving body of work in photographs and writing that explores my grandmother's unconventional life and loves and my childhood as the daughter of an electrical engineer who was also an inventor of the digital watch and a double agent working for the US government passing false documents to the Russian government. I wish he were here today. 
The writing motiva motivates the photographs and vice versa. In some series, they are independent and in others, crucially bound together. My grandmother, Elsie, began her career as a radio singer, singing patriotic songs during World War II. And years later, she decided to open a camp in the Berkshires. Elsie was a powerful role model. In 1946, when she opened the camp, it was not common for women to run their own business. She would travel during the springtime to the Bowery, where she would hire derelicts living on the streets to work in the camp kitchen. She gave them each a six pack of beer a day to keep their delirium tremors at bay. She traveled throughout the tri-state area with different men. A married woman traveling with men was not appropriate behavior in her day and her very proper family was scandalized. These are Elsie's disapproving parents. I spent every summer of my life from the age of two until 18 at Berkshire Hills Camp. My mother was the head counselor while my grandmother recruited the campers and ran the kitchen, overseeing the men from the Bowery. Bunk 11 had the youngest campers in the camp, though I was far younger than even the youngest for many years. Looking mischievous, I'm far right, sitting on the bench. I began to use my images as a narrative, Bunk Night. Bunk Night 1964 was a night etched in my memory. Everyone in the camp came to watch the different bunks perform their skits. Everyone, including the camp owner, my grandmother, the workers in the kitchen, and the entire staff. The best skits were awarded prizes consisting of colored paper coupons, which were used to buy candy, chips, or ice cream in the canteen. My bunk and many other bunks would create skits that would poke fun at the camp staff, camp mother, and camp owner. Standing on the stage, I joined in with my fellow bunkmates and made fun of my grandmother, calling her Elsie the Cow, a popular cartoon cow mas mascot for Borden Dairy Farm at that time, and made fun of the way my mother spoke. My mother was deaf. In my mind, I tried to pretend that they were not my family because I was just like the other campers. The audience applauded our skit. I walked off the stage and my brother came to me and strongly admonished me for making fun of my grandmother and my mom. He asked, how could you do that? How could you be so mean and hurtful? I felt horrible, just devastated to think that I could upset the feelings of the two women I loved the most in the world. I could not stop crying and threw away my winning coupons. That night, as I ran to tell my grandmother and my mom how sorry I was for saying what I said on stage, they told me they knew I was just performing. They said I was a great actress. In our master class, Memory as a Verb, Time and Transience, I continued writing stories from my life, from my childhood to the present, and to memories of my wedding, divorce, and the oppressed years in between. In these vignettes of a life, I am creating a memoir which propels the photograph that I am making. I experiment in putting them together, but in the end, the writing and the photography may exist independently. For now, they are appearing together in a zine, Silence Is, beginning with the story of me and my deaf mother. She reads lips, and if she turns her head, it signifies she's no longer listening. She exercises the strategy to silence me. Our communication has been controlled by it. My self portraits focusing on the head with my face turned to the side in different angles, reference my mother's way of not hearing by averting her eyes from the lips that are speaking to her. I am my mother in these portraits but in their dramatic light and dark atmosphere, the images are also expressive of my resentment and anxiety over not being understood. Her deafness can render me mute. I make use of an infrared camera to create dissonance. 
Here is one of the two stories included in the zine. Alexander's. I see myself in the tall, narrow mirror. I see my mother behind me down the aisle as I'm staring in the mirror. I'm in a bright white room with white hanging lights, high ceiling and no windows. The floor is shiny gray. The room has a haze. It's so bright. I see myself in the mirror in my mom's reflection. She's bending down. She's trying on shoes. I see the shoe boxes in the mirror. There are many shoe boxes. My mom is talking to a man and handing him shoe boxes. I see her and the man in the mirror. The shoe boxes are all white and exactly the same, stacked in rows and placed on shelves. The shelves are tall, but not too tall. Women are pulling out the shoe boxes and trying on shoes. I see all this reflected in the mirror. Everything is the same in the room behind me. I see myself in the mirror. The mirror is tall and has four sides wrapping a column. I stare at myself, look past myself in the mirror to see my mother. She is tall and pretty with thick, dark hair. She's a full mouth, a long, sharp nose and dark skin. She's wearing a skirt with many pleats, flat shoes and a white button down shirt with short sleeves. The shirt is tucked into her waistband. She has a small waist. I look to try to see my mom in the mirror, but she's gone. There are other women in the mirror, but not my mommy. My heart is beating fast. I'm frightened. I move to the side and look in another mirror and see her, but I can't reach her. I turn around and see her. She's there, but walking away from me. I call for her, mommy. She doesn't turn around. I call again, mommy. She doesn't turn around. I run as fast as I can to her. I think this is my mother. I reach her. I grab her skirt. She looks at me. She's angry. Why did you walk away from me? She asks. I'm crying, sobbing. We walk to the register and she hands the woman the box of shoes she's returning. The clerk asks my mom if she's ever worn the shoes. My mom says, no, never. But mom, I saw you wear the shoes. I say, she looks at me furiously. I say nothing. Thank you. And that's all for now. I hope you will continue to follow my journey as an artist, memoirist, and photographer. And please connect with me on Instagram and also please follow Memory as a Verb as our artist collective continues to create. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. That was wonderful. You're welcome. Um, so I have a few questions for you. Um, Jennifer asks, uh, I'm curious if Lori continues to use the four by five and is she using film uh, on the infrared work? Um, I do have a four by five camera. I don't use it often. Um, I use a medium format camera um, film with film and I don't use infrared film. I, I, my sensor has been changed um, to make it into an um, infrared sensor. I mostly use a 720 nanometer filter. So Judy Herman asks, uh, how did you suspend the flowers over the scanner? So I quickly learned that if I just placed the flowers directly on the glass of the scanner, they looked mushy and they were not attractive. So I would make a bouquet of flowers and I created a black box, which I sat on top of the scanner. I put a black cover on the box and I made a hole in the top of the black cover and I stuck the flower stems through it. So it, they would suspend over the glass plate of the scanner. And I had to figure out how close to get to the scanner or how far away. If it got too close, it would mush and not look attractive. If it got too far away, you wouldn't see much. So it meant redoing the arrangements, kind of figuring it out, but I had to create this black, I used foam core box, made a square, put it on top of the scanner bed and, and then played, played for months and months. <laughs> <laughs> um, Anne-Marie uh, Stillion asks, wait, so these images are your work from the ex exhibit or you or use these images as a starting point. And she's talking about silences. Like are, 
are these the images in the the memory as a verb? Yeah. Or are these the starting? Point? The ones in the in the in the zine are images that are um, that are in the exhibition. But I also have more images than just those that are in the zine. I've created um, many more images that I feel try to reflect my feeling um, growing up with a deaf mom and um, and her ability to turn away from me. And then I um, basically disappeared. I think, uh, so Lori, people are interested in purchasing the zine. How do they do that? Yeah, you can, um, if you want Instagram, message me um, at Lord Over, L-O-R-D-O-V-E-R, -E like Lord Over. It just happened that way. <laughs> and um, yeah, and then I'll, I'll message you back and uh, you'll send me your uh, information and I'll send you mine. Um, you know, what, what we're not seeing is how brilliantly uh, Lori used the idea of silence in her book and um, you know a black page or a blank page that really spoke to not being heard and um, you know during the, the pandemic which we're still in I mean one thing that I felt so strongly about how important it is for us to tell our stories and um, you're doing that in spades on so many levels. And I have a feeling you're gonna have many other books to, that will come out, but bravo on that. And I've got uh, one more question for you from, let's see, Annette. You've explored so many genres as a photographer. What's next? Hmm. I don't know. <clears throat> you know, I, I'm going to, I, I, because of the archival images and writing as much as I'm doing now, I am um, going to sort of work on combining new work with the archival images. And I'm not, I'm still trying to figure out the best way to do it or a different way to do it. Um, as far as technology, I don't know if something comes out, I'll be the first trier. What do they call you? A, uh, a beta tester? <laughs> That'll be me. <laughs> okay, I actually have a few more questions. You're not off the hook yet. Um, is your mother still, Susan Gordon asks, is your mother still living? And if so, what is it like to share your work with her? So yeah, my mom is 92. And, um, you know, she lives in a, um, a a visual world, sorry, where there's not much nuance. And um, she can really only see, really understand, and I'm not sure if it's her age or just the fact that she's deaf or, but she really only sort of understands concrete images. So like she'll understand a picture of my grandson or my daughter or my son, but but if I were to show her a picture of me with my head turned to the side, she'd say, why is your hair in your eyes? She wouldn't, there's no way to get her to the place of emotion or nuance, like I said. So I don't, I don't go there. Uh, it's, it's too difficult. And Amy asks, Amy Selwyn asks, Lori, are you considering working with your father's amazing story? Yeah. Yeah, I've started writing about his, his, him and his story and also collecting more stories about him. Um, so, you know, I, I knew something that was going on, but, and I knew something was weird when I was growing up because um, I was actually followed um, for many of my years by American agents. Um, so, but I, you know, he tried to keep me in the dark and my mother and my brother, but my brother started to work with my father and then he learned everything. So I'm getting more stories and we'll start telling, telling that and working with images and um, other things that came from that period of time. Okay, one more question, but first I want to answer Anne-Marie Stillion's question, archival image, are archival images family photos and yes they are anything that is not current is considered archival so many many artists are mining their family photos to make work um, 
And Dina finally, Dina Eber finally asked the question, is there a connection between the flowers in your current silence is work? There seems to be. And maybe you don't know, and that's something to percolate on. Yeah, I, mm, <laughs> there, there probably is. Uh, a, a lot was going on in my life during the creation of all this work. So I'm sure there's an emotional thread through all of it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Lori. I hope you spend some time on the chat. You got lots of love on the chat, so don't okay. miss that. OK, thank um, you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. And uh, now I would like to introduce the wonderful Elizabeth Bailey. Um, Elizabeth is a Los Angeles-based artist who uses photography to create evocative imagery that explores the themes of self, identity, memory, and longing. Since the 1990s, she has used stage scenes, portraiture, and self-portraiture with implied narratives to consider what we conceal and reveal about ourselves to others. Born and raised in Minnesota, Bailey moved to Los Angeles at 18 to attend Occidental College. After receiving a BA in philosophy, she went on to study photography and graphic design, finding that each informed the other, and that is so true. She currently works as a graphic designer and a fine art photographer, and I have to give her big kudos because she is our graphic designer for this project. And Annette LeMay Burke is our website designer for this project. So we have two talented uh, women in the class that were able to produce that. And finally, her work has been exhibited in galleries nationally and internationally, including Lightbox Gallery in Portland, A. Smith Gallery in Johnson City, Texas, the P PH21 Gallery in Budapest, Hungary. Her, her photographs have been published in books and magazines, including Float, Stubborn, and Shots Magazine, and are held in private collections. Welcome, Elizabeth. And I have to say, I love this project. It is right up my alley, so I can't wait for her to share it with you. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you so much. Let's see. Um, all right. Does that look good? Looks great. Awesome. Okay. Hello. I'd like to say thank you to everyone for coming to these talks, to the LACP for hosting them and to Allian Smithson and my fellow Memory is a Verb artists for creating such an inspiring and thoughtful group and environment, one that I feel proud and grateful to be part of. I'm Elizabeth Bailey, a fine art photographer based in Los Angeles. Memory has figured prominently as a central theme in my work since I first began making photos. Some memories, like many from my childhood, might feel like hazy shadows or vague recollections, yet they're at the very foundation of self-awareness, thought, and motivation. Who I am today cannot be totally severed from this past self, yet the past can always be re-examined and reframed to mean and to become different things. A singular static experience is no longer fixed in time, place, or even reality, when I reconsider it through the lens of the camera. I use photography to explore emotional states, past and present, in this way. Often I can best articulate my insights or experiences through imagery. My intention is not necessarily to convey a clear message, but to provoke more questions and feelings in the viewer based on their own lived experience. My early life shaped these fascinations that have come to define my work. I grew up in a family that appeared outwardly stable and successful, feeling overlooked and unseen, with loneliness and longing as my defining experience. Reading books and writing poetry dominated my early life. I was a voracious reader of fairy tales, fiction, and classic literature. The youngest of four children, I was raised in Northfield, Minnesota, a small Midwestern town south of Minneapolis. 
It was a quaint small town surrounded by farmland and open spaces and unique in that it was also home to two excellent liberal arts colleges, St. Olaf College and Carleton College. And this is downtown Main Street. My father taught at Carleton. He began his career as a professor of English literature in 1965. His PhD was in English lit, but he'd also studied photography and cinema, his real passions. In 1966, before I was born, he founded the Cinema Studies Department at Carleton College and began to shape that curriculum. I grew up with art films, foreign films, and classic films <coughs> constantly playing in our living room, back then on beta and VHS, while dad made his lecture notes. He also had a dark room in our basement where he processed and printed his own photos, which were primarily documenting our family. I don't think dad considered himself an artist, but when I look back at the huge photographic archive he created, his artistry is clear. He taught me to appreciate photography, film, and all kinds of visual imagery. Yet I didn't try my hand at photography until later in life. I graduated from high school and moved to Los Angeles to attend Occidental College. I thought I might major in literature, but I switched to philosophy. I loved deeply considering and analyzing ideas, and I found that in philosophy. After graduating with my BA in the late 80s, I had a series of unfulfilling office jobs. Seeking something new, I enrolled in night classes in photography and graphic design. I had a self-portrait assignment in photography class, and this unleashed something in me. I began to experiment and to document my life as my father had done with his photography. But my documentation was not fully based in realism. I was in my 20s living in low rent houses and apartments with roommates. I recruited them into my photos and reimagined my life as something else. I concocted fantasy scenarios. I began toying with narratives. I worked with a friend who was a poet responding to her poems with imagery. I created a large body of work, mostly on nights and weekends. Dreams and nightmares were what captivated me, what I returned to as a subject again and again. But I was also interested in what I saw happening on the streets around me. And that was what motivated me to create my first street series, Photos of the Broadway District in downtown Los Angeles in 1999. Downtown was gentrifying and I was watching it change. I wanted to capture how it was at that moment. There was an energy I found exciting and also scary. I was compelled to try to document it. I began heading downtown on the weekends with my dad's Yoshika T4 loaded with Tri-X film. This camera had a viewfinder on the top. I could hold it at my waist and compose the images while looking down. I spent about a year visiting the area every Saturday making photos. I often wished I had a cloak of invisibility, but sometimes the power of an image came from being directly looked at. After completing this project in 1999, I stopped doing photography for a while while I worked as a graphic designer. I had a series of in-house design jobs for Skecher Shoes, designing catalog print and packaging, for Paul Mitchell Hair Care, and for Mattel Toys, where I worked on Barbie for several years. During this time, I got married in 2006, and my daughter was born in 2007. I focused on motherhood, on raising my daughter while she was young. In 2015, I started making photographs again when my father was dying and my marriage was unraveling. Everything seemed to be falling apart. In emotional turmoil, I found self-portraiture helped. So I started documenting my state of mind as a way to cope. 
In the midst of multiple transitions, I created a body of work I later titled In Flux, which was about the shifting sense of self and the unease and sadness at the core of it. Much of this went all the way back to my childhood because I'd never fully processed how growing up in the atmosphere of tension and unhappiness surrounding my parents' marriage had affected me and shaped who I am. My daughter was now 10, about the same age I'd been when I started trying to escape my home life. As a child, I had sought solace by retreating into a wild wooded area near my home. I had escaped into nature and into solitary fantasies I created, fueled by fiction and imagination. In 2017, I began to work with my daughter on a photo series, The Woods, based on this time in my life. I visually recreated the memories I had, and it became a way for me to reevaluate them and see myself with compassion rather than the sense of deficiency I'd felt in my youth. As I worked on the series, I could let go of the past bit by bit. I was working intuitively, wading through a tangle of memories, which seemed to grow ever more tangled as the project went on. What a powerful metaphor it is to get lost in the woods. When I tried to write a statement defining the series in words, I felt lost in a maze of my own construction. It had so many different meanings to me. My perspective kept changing. I reshot it differently in 2019, then revised it yet again. Finally, I came to the conclusion that the woods was always about the experience for me. I was with my daughter. We were spending time together. I was moving forward. I kept making the work. I drew on fairy tales and mythology as visual influences, deliberately mixing beauty and dark symbolism to show both the allure and implied danger inherent in venturing into the unknown. I reread Joseph Campbell, who writes in The Power of Myth about self-knowledge. The dark moment is the moment when the real message of transformation is going to come. At the darkest moment comes the light. I do feel that this series moved me toward the light, but I still don't know if I'm done making it. My current series, The House Next Door, is my contribution to the Memories of Herb project. Initially, this was not a photo project at all. It started as an investigation into the unknown past of another person. This was someone I knew or thought I did, and I began to wonder as it progressed, what does it mean to know someone? As knowledge changes, so does perception of both the past and the present. In neurologist Oliver Sacks' book, Hallucinations, he writes, memories are not fixed or frozen, but are transformed, disassembled, reassembled, and recategorized with every act of recollection. In this case, another person's memories caused me to reevaluate not just that person, but myself as well. In early 2020, the mail started piling up at the house next door. This was definitely not normal. I had lived next door to my neighbor for 17 years. I knew her habits and I spoke to her often, every few days. I knew her well and not at all. What began with the mail piling up initiated a cascade of events that led to my current project, The House Next Door. To explain the backstory, here's part of a piece I wrote about how it began. I walked over to the house next door and knocked on the front door. After that, I knocked on the windows. I circled the house, called her name, and peeked over the weathered gate we share that divides our properties. I yelled into her tiny, silent backyard, a chaotic jumble of climbing roses and overgrown weeds competing for life. And after that, I called the police. Let me tell you about our houses. Our houses are less than 10 feet apart. 
Both are tiny Spanish style bungalows built in 1930, each under 800 square feet. The exteriors look similar. I always assumed they were built together as a pair. They overlap each other. The north side of her house touches the entire edge of my driveway, all the way down to my garage, which sits partially on her property in her backyard. Six windows on the driveway side of her house look directly into my living room and bedroom windows. If I were to lay down sideways in my driveway and stretch out my arms and legs, I could almost be touching both houses at once. As neighbors, our edges overlapped, but until recently, never our interiors. The police broke a window, went in, and found her in the bedroom. They asked me a lot of questions. I don't know why I asked to go inside, but I did, and they let me. It was dusk, and the house was poorly lit. I hesitated, disoriented, struggling to see clearly in the dim light. What gradually came into focus was a nightmarish version of my own house. Same materials, proportions, and details with the floor plan flipped, a reverse mirror image of my own. But her house was crammed full of clutter, trash, dirt, and decaying beautiful things. All this was hidden behind dusty, disintegrating lace curtains, concealing it all. The police, coroner's office, and the public administrator all followed up with me. She had no living family and no close friends. Everything was going into probate. The house would sit vacant for months, possibly years. I looked across my driveway at the tightly shuttered windows. What else was in there that I didn't see? What had happened in her life to get to this point? If I went back in the house, could I find out? Who had she been, this stranger I knew? I couldn't stop thinking about the house next door. So I started breaking into it. I did not photograph the house at first when it was full of her possessions. That came later. At first, I was just looking, wanting to understand. I unearthed shoeboxes of letters, old photos, things she had written. I pored over it all. I read about her thoughts, beliefs, and ideals. I was actually starting to know her. She was no longer going to disappear. I began to piece together a tumultuous past history. She had moved far away from her family, eventually cutting off contact. She wrote that growing up, the house I lived in and the family I lived with were a hostile presence. She began traveling alone. She kept detailed journals. She wrote about how she valued independence and her solitary life. She wrote about not wanting people too close to her or having expectations of her. She collected and held on to things. She saved everything. Early one morning, a cleanout crew drove up with a dumpster. Trucks followed. For the next two days, they methodically unloaded every valuable from the house, tagging furniture and rugs and vases and boxes and china, hauling them away in the trucks. Everything else, her personal items of no value, were tossed into the dumpster. Although I knew this day would come, I was unprepared for my emotional response. I was near panic as I watched helplessly. I had grown attached to her story, to the house, and to feeling as though I were a caretaker of her history and her things. The reality came crashing down. My proximity had felt like privilege, but it wasn't. That night, I climbed into the dumpster and retrieved everything I could. I returned to the now empty house, bringing with me the items I'd salvaged. 
a psychological shift had occurred and the ephemeral nature of this experience was laid bare. It could end at any moment. At this point, I began making photos documenting everything. The house, the objects I'd saved, the play of light on the walls, the dusty lace curtains, the patina of dirt, and finally myself in the house having this experience. I have asked myself many times what I was doing in that house. I was witnessing a small portion of who one person was. There's nobody to hold on to her things to remember her now. I will never know the complete story. In fact, what is a complete story? To tell any story, you have to leave things out. And certain things have been added too. I had only the salvaged remnants of a life and my own perspective. So is this story real? Most of it is real. It is about human frailty, mine and hers, and voyeurism, mine. To see a person, any person, open and unguarded is not an everyday occurrence. It was a kind of emotional voyeurism that led me into the house next door. But now it feels like a tribute to untold stories and to beauty in many forms. I began this project thinking that my neighbor was so different from me that I was nothing like her. And I came to see that wasn't so. I realized one day that I was using the house next door as a distraction from things I wanted to avoid. Disappearing into the house was so engrossing. Being there took me outside of myself, away from my own life, away from ordinary reality. I was not so different from her. As I finish this project, I feel my own resistance. It has to end, but I don't want it to. The house is going up for auction. I don't know when. I'm nervous about this. I expect it will be torn down, that my house's twin will disappear, destroyed in the push for something bigger, newer, more expensive. And when that happens, I will document that too. I think if all the work I've created and shown you has something in common, it's a desire to connect with the emotion and motivation that drives stories, whether those stories are mine or those of others. Our lives are transient, but our search for meaning is universal. I want to leave you with a quote I found in a book I'm reading by Rebecca Solnit. Listen, you're not yourself. You are crowds of others. You are as leaky a vessel as was ever made. You have spent vast amounts of your life as someone else, as people who died long ago, as people who never lived, as strangers you never met. The usual I we are given has all the tidy containment of the kind of character the realist novel specializes in, and none of the porousness of our every waking moment, the loose threads, the strange dreams, the forgettings and misrememberings, the portions of a life lived through others' stories, the incoherence and inconsistency and the companionability of ghosts. There are other ways of telling. Thank you. Wow, Elizabeth, you're getting a lot of love in the chat. So oh. uh, <laughs> please okay. take a look. Okay. Um, I, I am also a voyeur and I just so resonate with this project. I feel like it could be a movie, um, it could be a novel, but your telling of it, your articulation of it was so beautifully done um, besides the images, which are also incredible. So thank you for that. Um, I, uh, I mean, have you thought about having this go beyond a photo project into something else? It, would you ever consider writing a screenplay or? I mean, I, I'd love to write. Um, I've never written a screenplay or thought about it, um, but I do, I have thought it would make a good movie. I mean. Yeah. Um, 
And of course, I have to ask, have you ever felt her present in the house? You know, I haven't, and which I feel like is not the answer people want, but it's the truth. And um, yeah, I don't know. Well, Dina asked a similar question. Do you feel her guiding you? I, I feel like I was, I know, I mean, I just feel like I'm the right person to be right next door. Um, I don't know, that's all I can say. But we're early in, in this journey. I mean, anything can happen. Yeah. Um, okay, the chat is going wild right now. Um, <laughs> Yvette asks, um, I love this captivating how you portrayed the story is marvelous. Did you have any fear in going into the house? Did you enter solo? Yes, definitely. Th that's an interesting thing. I was super duper scared in the beginning, absolutely terrified. Um, I got more and more calm, I guess you would say, and confident. And then finally, I did start going in at night. That was the last part that I could do. Um, but I always had been taking care of her garden. Um, uh, since the beginning and also this is just a side note but she would travel a lot when she was alive and she would always leave notes in my mailbox about when she was going to be gone and she would always ask me to watch her house so she it was like there had been all these years of her asking me to watch the house so I was just still watching the house. Roland's commented that this is good for at least three seasons on a Netflix show. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me just check. Um, do you have any plans to publish this work as a book? Yes, so I do. And I'm actually well underway with that. Um, I just need to, to finish it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, someone asked, Natalie asked, what did you know about your neighbor when she was alive? Well, I talked to her a lot, and but I knew her, I knew her well, superficially well. You know, when you just see someone around, I did not know she'd been so different when she was younger. I just didn't know, I just didn't know her well. Yeah. Uh, Rachel Siegel asks, is this about your own mortality? Um. It's about loss, definitely. It's, a, it's about coming to terms with the transience, our theme of transience, that it's beautiful and it's sad to recognize that everything has a letting go attached to it, you know? So yeah. yeah. And Coco McCabe asks, did you ever go in her house when she was alive? No. She, she didn't, not only that, I never saw a single person go into her house when she was alive in 17 years. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I've never gone into my next door neighbor's house, which who is a friend and I've lived next door to her for 24 years. So, uh, wow, <laughs> people are strange. Um, I think everyone has such fascination with the story, but I want to speak to the work. Um, you are just a master at light and at narrative storytelling. And I don't really have a question about it, but how do you construct your images? I mean, do you look for light first or do you have the concept first or? I look for a mood. I, I, go, I go to it thinking, what is my feeling? What, what is this supposed to feel like? And then that's the lighting will come next. Yeah. Um, okay, how did you create the images where you were included in the image images? They're so evocative. Oh, that's just a tripod and a, have a remote control for my camera. Yeah. And I'll end it with Susan's comment. You've done a beautiful job respecting her dignity. The images portray such beauty and respect. Can you say something about the process of telling or showing her story? Yeah, that's a great question, Susan. Um, you know, it's, I'm glad that I've been working on this a couple of years because 
it's evolved. And I've realized that it's really important to show someone with dignity and to be protective of what I show. And there's a lot of stuff I'm not showing. And there are things that I've retouched out to protect privacy and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I just want to show that she was a survivor and that there was beauty in how she lived. Yeah. I think one thing that we discussed in class was how making this work, you were taking on her whole life story and um, how hard that is to, to be the final keeper of the flame. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all. I mean, it does, like what Rachel asked, it does touch on this element of fear. Like, you know, I guess I didn't want her to disappear in the same way that I don't want to disappear or none of us wants anything around us to disappear. You know, there's, there's part of that. Um, just sensing what what was good or beautiful about someone or, or a time and just not wanting it to go away. Yeah. And that's part of why I love photography. You get to, to capture something. Yeah. Right. Um, I do want to say, which I didn't say at the beginning, is that in the last 10 days, we have featured all the projects from Memory as a Verb on Lynn Scratch. So um, and the artists were interviewed by each other. So there's some great interviews in those posts. So if you're interested, you can go to Lynn Scratch and find out more about these bodies of work. So Elizabeth, thank you so much. That thank was you. Just a brilliant uh, presentation. Okay. And please go to the chat now and when you're relaxing with your <laughs> glass of wine and read all the love coming your way. Um, all right, next up is the wonderful Rosalie Rosenthal. Rosalie is an artist who uses lens-based and cameraless photography to investigate the transience of objects in place, transformed by context and perspective. Her practice looks beyond the intended purpose or the expected vantage point to cultivate nuance and possibility. Rosenthal received a BFA from the University of Louisville's Height Art Institute and a BA in History from Smith College. She has exhibited nationally at the Griffin Museum of Photography, Filter Space Gallery, Chicago, the Los Angeles Center of Photography, Spalding University, the Kentucky Museum of Art and Craft, and Manifest Gallery in Cincinnati. Her photographs have been published in Fraction Magazine, a photo editor, and Manifest Gallery Photography Annuals. Her work is collected by the 21C Museum Hotels, Omni Louisville, Louisville, and private in private collections. Residencies include Maker Circle in Marshall, North Carolina, uh, and Residency Unlimited in Brooklyn, New York, Originally from St. Louis, Missouri, Rosenthal now lives in Louisville, Kentucky, where she works from her studio in the Portland neighborhood. And I have to say, Rosalie is such a talented photographer. The work that you're going to see tonight is just a, a little sampling of, of what she does. And she's a, an incredible innovator working in historical processes. So she is going beyond the digital image. So welcome, Rosalie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eileen. And uh, I'm so grateful for your guidance over the last year. And I also just want to show my appreciation for the friends in this cohort who with Eileen have just made it a pleasure to work together. Um, and hello, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, before I start, I do want to extend my appreciation to LACP for hosting the Memory as a Verb talks and for the rich programming that's uh, been the bright spot in the pandemic. So thank you. I'd like to begin by touching on a few early experiences that influenced the themes of time, histories, and legacy that are important to my artwork. And a little background about myself. 
I was born and raised in St. Louis, where I grew up in this house in a suburban neighborhood alongside my parents and sister. I was lucky enough too to have one of my grandmothers living in the neighborhood. I had lots of adventures as a child. Uh, my mother captured many of them as she studied photography and made prints in her basement darkroom. I was often around photography, posing or watching my mother take portraits. I felt familiar with the medium, even though I wasn't off and running with a camera at an early age. My enthusiasm for photography was actually dampened early on when I overheard a photographer call this picture of mine cliched. I was old enough to understand the meaning of the word, but young enough to be embarrassed and put off. But I still was creative and enjoyed making things. Many abstract paintings hanging throughout hung throughout our house and influenced my artistic tastes. Returning to these images day in and day out, I was always comfortable with non-representational and ambiguous Im imagery. In my family, learning, culture, and engagement were valued and modeled. Both parents regularly enrolled in philosophy, literature, and other humanities classes throughout their lives. While I would characterize my family as creative, I would also say that creativity was tempered by formality and tradition. Before Ancestry.com and DNA testing, as kids, we went on genealogy road trips looking for information from archives, distant relations, and cemeteries. And locating a hard to find grave marker was a gain that earned us a quarter, and we made rubbings of the stones to document them. These trips made an impression and got me thinking about the soup of people and circumstance that contributed to my makeup. Family history was a recurring topic of conversation. This diary entry and accompanying photograph are among my favorite memorabilia because they take, contain information about the first Rosalie in the United States and the arrival of my direct ancestors to St. Louis from France. Having this simple connection to my namesake made the story resonate. I'll read just a little snippet. It's just 11 years that we landed in this town, also on a Sunday morning. The snow covered the ground deeply and the day was cold. Well, I remember how at break of day from the deck of the steamboat Arabia, my eyes were glancing up and down the city, knowing that this was to be our halting place, trying to pierce the future. Our inquiries for the abode of our dear Aunt Rosalie were fruitless until in the afternoon, having visited the cathedral and also inquired there, we were directed to Mr. P. Shoto's on Market Street and at last had the happiness to clasp her in her arms. <coughs> this is some of the family uh, photos on the wall of my house. The ancestors on the left are from my mother's family, a large Catholic family with pictures, diaries, heirlooms, and stories passed through generations. As a child, I felt my connection to these forebears because their memory was kept alive through tangible artifacts and remembrances from living family members. I also felt connected to the branches of the tree with gaps in information. I found the absence heightened my curiosity and longing for connection. This was especially true for my father's Jewish ancestors pictured here on the right. At the same time that history was being pieced together through genealogy research, I grew up witnessing Alzheimer's erase my grandfather's history. I used to think of memory in absolute terms. It was retained or it was forgotten, in the brain or not. A generation later when my dad showed Alzheimer's symptoms, I came to fully understand the transient nonlinear nature of our memories. A recollection flickers forward, recedes, then reemerges, gradually spiraling until it's gone. I left St. Louis to attend Smith College. I always enjoyed being creative and making, but I did not feel especially gifted at representational drawing, so I never thought to study studio art. I chose history, which actually provided a good foundation for becoming an artist because of the similarities in, its, in understanding text and visual language. Reading and decoding historical texts, my favorite professor instilled that nuance of tone and acts of omission are just as critical to meaning as what is made explicit. 
And this learning informs my exploration of what is revealed and concealed, known or suggested. Both my grandfather and father loved their careers in insurance. So after college, I began my professional life in the industry thinking that if I liked it, I might work with my dad someday. But after six years, my heart wasn't in it. So when I had my, my son, it was an easy decision to move on. While raising my two children, I channeled my creativity into making photo books. The historian and archivist in me wanted the kids to have access to their histories. On an unconscious level, in creating these keepsakes, I may have been hedging my own worries about accessing memory and history as I age. Throughout my 20s and 30s, during both career and parenting, I took a variety of classes in different media. I really enjoyed a beginning black and white darkroom class, but the timing was off. I became pregnant and soon after was wrapped up in locating, relocating from Chicago to Louisville, Kentucky, where I now live. By 2009, after six years in Louisville, I knew I wanted to spend more time studying art in a structured way, so I applied to the BFA program at the University of Louisville. During my time there, I developed an interest in photographic processes through an exploration of everyday materials. I'll give you a brief look at my BFA work. I initially concentrated in sculpture because I've always responded to the tactile aspect of making. But I discovered that I could have the experience in photography by constructing and staging my photographs. I used shredded paper to think about overwhelm, waste, and the value of materials. I was all about the ideas at this phase and had more to learn about for lighting and composition. But I was most at ease in the dark room and I embraced the process of composing photograms, placing objects atop photosensitive paper and exposing them to light. This work records sweepings from my home and is paired with its reference sample in my own writing. Because of the time I spent at home with my children when they were small, I wanted to make artwork about my experience in domestic space. And photo objects were a good way to bridge together sculpture and photography. I found Man Ray and Laszlo Maholi Naj's photograms really exhilarating. Man Ray spoke about his work in a language that resonated with me. He said, in the realm of images, photography was uniquely situated to depict an artist's internal landscape by focusing on ordinary objects and rendering them extraordinary by de decontextualizing them in some way. I interpret uniquely situated as having to do with the rapid fire way photograms form in a dark room. Relative to other photographic processes, one can intuitively compose, process, and repeat since the fast exposure and developing times allow for a short feedback loop. In the dark room, photograms spill out quickly like thought fragments. By temperament, I'm suited to this process because I can overthink, edit too quickly, and get caught up in meaning before I'm done making. But being out of the recognized workforce for over a decade, I suspect my psyche connected with an impulse to elevate everyday overlooked materials as subject matter. Just in here are specific and personal subject matter, being of us and of our homes, but they're also common and universal. And I see the vaguely familiar forms reaching outward, seeking recognition from the viewer. I continued investigating ordinary materials here with the historic cyanotype process. I was introduced to the scanner as an alternative lens to the camera, and I instantly loved the way of illuminating and the way chance works itself into the process when composing upside down on a scanner bed. The same subject matter translates so differently depending on process. In earlier dust photograms, identifying information like color and text are missing. We are left with shapes that suggest something beyond the component parts. But with the scanner, the information appears suspended for close inspection. For my graduation exhibition, six inch piles of sweepings were enlarged into four foot square images. I began to think conceptually about the way our cast offs form de facto portraits in space and time. And the scale shift is a tool to consider what receives our attention. 
I'd like to share a few projects that explore themes of time, transience, memory, and family. After graduation, I brought my photograms into an installation format. This work was part of an exhibition at Kentucky Museum of Art and Craft, exploring vestiges of animal life and the relationship between humans, animals, and the natural world. The circular shapes present an ambiguous orientation, creating an association with microscopic looking and cellular structure, while also referencing a telescopic view and universal interconnectivity. Martin's army developed from the discovery of a box of vintage toy soldiers. I was drawn to the random assortment and juxtaposition of historical figurines across the ages and their time-worn quality that seemed to embed years of play and handling. Oops, excuse me. The images recall historical oil paintings with epic battle scenes. The soldiers imbued with a faux art historical context speak to the folly and perpetual nature of conflict. I think of my creative process as exhausting the material. I experiment with photographic processes because each articulation generates a new perspective for understanding the same object. In relief, the rhythm of the silhouettes and the missing limbs are most noticeable. They could exist as memorialized wars, warriors on a building freeze. In this iteration, I can explore time as both expansive and transient. Conflict is ever present and cyclical through the ages, even when individual lives are relatively short. Sorry, there seems to be a little lag in the pressing the button. Preparing uh, similar figurines, I found an opening for humor and pathos. Here's some gallery shots from the exhibition, just to give you a sense of scale of the work. When my uncle Tim died, he left a lifetime accumulation of his matchbooks. I was drawn to their embedded history. They showed a record of places visited, graphic styling from different eras and wear and tear. And belonging to a smoker whose life was shortened from the habit, the collection speaks to memory and transience. Seeing them in an enormous hurricane jar, I was drawn to the form in multiples. Many contain terrific artwork specific to a restaurant or bar. I return to object making with this small assemblage. The box insides are papered in a pattern made from matchbook covers. Inside, the tips create a texture through subtle variations of white that come with age. Midlife Tableau is the, my work that's in memory of, is a verb collective. Midlife is this strange juncture where we begin to identify with mortality because we recognize it in our parents. And watching children become adults, we know that we're no longer young. From this vantage point, I consider a legacy passed to me from previous generations through the experience of photographing family heirlooms. Legacy doesn't exist without loss and ultimately death. And my dad's memory loss set my midlife tableau exploration in motion. As my dad needed a higher level of caregiving, my parents sold their house. The scenario is a familiar one. Downsizing means packing up possessions, giving away, tossing or selling superfluous items and passing on heirlooms to the next generation. Both my grandmother and father were inveterate article clippers, and I stopped the cleaning sorting process to fondly commemorate his habit. Back in my studio, these were some of the first compositions I made in late 2019, creating visual puzzles of juxtaposing elements. The main subjects were things that arrived from my parents, my old camera, a footstool, dad's office files dating back to my birth year, paired with something from my home or studio. Initially, I found the influx of things overwhelming, but I started to make sense of it by emptying boxes, looking, and slowly composing. 
Looking through a lens creates physical distance, perspective, and framing, but it also allows distance, perspective, and framing of a psychological nature. And arranging these tight compositions gave me a feeling of agency and control. But I came to understand that I also needed to share the emotional aspects of the project. In 2020, I began photographing myself and my daughter with the object, and that was a turning point for the project. I assembled this mobile to express the intangible gifts and weight of our family legacies and the ever-present conscious and unconscious ways families influence the individual. Some family histories are simply inaccessible for a host of reasons. Information is lost, hidden, memories fade. The familial information that we use to inform our identity is not a tidy, knowable legacy. And I wanted to express that idea visually. Many of us have an iconic remembrance of our parents that memorializes them at a time when their strength and self-possession were at their peak. This portrait of my mother captures this for me and preserves her legacy at this moment. The fact that the portrait is a painting and creation of another person underscores that memory is indeed a construction. I wanted to create a rhythm in this series between portraits and inanimate objects that could be used as metaphor. The aesthetic of this series derives from Dutch still life painting. And in this image, my daughter and I are both revealed and obscured. The reflection harkens to the practice of the artist including themselves in the composition. This is Vanitas with Violin and Glass Ball by Peter Klaas from 1597. And you can see the artist and the room reflected in the looking glass to the left of the composition. You'll also notice the fallen feather, the open nut, the skull, all part of the visual language that is evidence of time and progression. Cut organic material lies in contrast with hard tarnished baby rattles. Each object is embedded with its own suggestion of time and mortality. I really responded to the form and gesture of this plant. It felt maternal to me, as though the flower had leaves like protective arms. The late afternoon light both enlivens the brush and also emphasizes its status as an inanimate and obsolete object. Reflections and shadows are some of the memento mori symbols in this series borrowed from traditional still life painting. My grandmother's monogram juxtaposed with youth joins these motifs as another temporal sign. Light and shadow in a room signal the cycle of passing days. This image includes the legacy of a particular object and also speaks to the legacy of a belief system. Being of two traditions, but belonging to neither, I felt religious legacy as detached, but strong presence. The Steiner room set has been in my mom's family for several generations, and I wish it could channel past dinner conversations. I want to know the people who no longer convene around the table. Throughout the project, I thought about the meaning of receiving beautiful objects like silver tea sets. Today, obsolescence undermines their value, especially to younger generations whose lives and careers make them more mobile, and their belongings are more streamlined than past generations. I brought expired bulbs to bring a contemporary memento mori element to the traditional still life. The resplendent shine of silver makes it a frequent motif in the vanitas genre, a self-portrait reflected in silver seemed apropos as I consider a legacy in these heirlooms. The tarnished silver erodes the preciousness. And with the blurring, I wanted to suggest that we can't look selectively at our histories for our sense of self. This final image in the series is a formal still life that well represents my work in midlife tableau. Legacy knows loss and the tenuous nature of memory. Legacy also knows endurance in the decayed fragments of artifacts and wisps of remembrances 
as well as in the vibrancy of a new generation. I will leave you with my recent cyanotypes. They were the antidote to working on an emotionally weighty series. In the summer of 2020, my father died of COVID in his nursing room, in his nursing home. It was August and the weather was beautiful. I was moved to work outside, take in the sunlight and create in a loose and spontaneous way, thinking of my dad's spirit out there somewhere. Thank you so much. I invite you to follow me on uh, Instagram. And it was just a pleasure being here this evening. What an incredible presentation. You are thank so you. articulate and eloquent. And um, thank you for sharing that incredible bod bodies of work. Um, you know, just as a joke, my first question might be, how dirty was your house? Created. Yeah, my sister warned me that that was going to be coming. <laughs> you don't have to answer. I'm just. It's only I'm, just a little bit. <laughs> no. yeah. um, keep in mind, there was a scale shift. So um, really, I like taped out a six inch square on the scanner bed and, um, you know, put the collection there and really enlarged it. So, OK, that looks worse than it is. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think many of us have gone through the difficult experience of cleaning out our parents' homes and, um, and trying to decide what things go into our futures and what we let go of. And I'm wondering if in making this work, you were able to let go of things you might not have let go of if you hadn't photographed them. I think so. I mean, you know, I think the rubber will hit the road, you know, when I move out of my house, you know, when that happens, you know, it, it's easy to keep things when they're just stuck in the basement. But um, yes, it's hard, but yes. And I think in the meantime, I'm trying to uh, incorporate as much of it into projects as I can. And I think that's a nice way to have a send off. Yeah, exactly. Um, Let's see. Um, Anne Marie Stillion asked, "Did you do the silhouettes on the scanner?" No, those were in the dark room. Oh, interesting. Photograms. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Ellen Lutwak had an interesting comment. After cleaning out my late parents' home recently, I now realize how much. Uh, missed creative opportunities uh, she had. Kudos to you for capturing these moments and times. Thank you. Now I have to like dig down here. Um, Elizabeth asks, Rosalie, your work is just so beautiful and impressive. I love that you have 3D work as well. Do you have any projects um, you plan to work on next after Cosmos? Oh, I have a lot of um, thoughts. I'll, let's see. One is a photographic um, exploration of Louisville, where I live. You know, when I drive to my studio or bike to my studio from my home, I kind of cross this dividing line, this corridor that separates parts of the city in a very unhealthy way. And um, it's just got me thinking about separation and boundaries and community. So I've been exploring that photographically. Um, I just finished sealing up my um, studio space so that it's light tight. And so I will be doing some um, more darkroom work in here. Yes, for the last year, the entire class has been incredibly jealous of your studio <laughs> space. So <laughs> It is one of the benefits of living here. The real estate is not so pricey. Yeah. And I also want to recognize that Rosalie just um, had one of the images from her series um, on the cover of uh, 
light and shadow magazine. Is that right? Or shadow yeah. and light, light and shadow? Shadow and light. Shadow and light magazine. It's a beautiful cover. So congratulations for that. And um, basically everything in the chat is just uh, lots of love. So, um, oh, we have one more from Rachel. Do you consider this work feminist? I would, especially dealing with domestic, the domestic and care. Hmm. Are, are you, is Rachel, are you speaking more about the, um, the photograms or the work with the dust and hair or the midlife tableau project? Well, I will say, I, you know, I, I feel like- Dust and hair, dust and hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do, I definitely do. And I kind of, um, you know, I look back to some of the women artists that were working in the 70s and using, um, you know, these kind of common feminine materials to make their artwork. And yes, so I do. Thank you for noticing that. So thank you, Rosalie. Uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, as I say, I know how hard it is to show up at the end of the day and be present. And um, I just have so much appreciation for all the um, wonderful comments and questions you extended to the artists. And um, I just feel so lucky to have these three women in my life. And um, so everyone have a wonderful evening and uh, we'll see you next month.